For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong, I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. Good morning, church. Good to see everyone who has come to share in God's worship service on this morning as we have all looked to strengthen our relationship with Christ. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that you're our welcome guest, and we hope that something that we will do or say on this morning will help strengthen your relationship with Christ as well. We want you to know that you're always welcome here at the Main Street Church of Christ, and we ask that you please come back and visit with us again at the next available opportunity after today's worship service. To our friends and brethren nationally and internationally in TV land, we welcome you as well, and we're delighted for your presence on this morning. When we come to the pages of Psalms chapter 23, we find two of the most memorable but oftentimes misapplied scriptures to those with some form of godliness. David reveals to us how God desires to be our eternal shepherd as he invites us into his personal conversation with God and reveals to us how God wants to be our physical and spiritual guide and comforter as he transitions us to life eternal with them. It is in this great chapter that we will learn the benefits of why we should surrender unto God and allow him alone to lead and control our lives. Notice what the Bible says in verse 1 of Psalms chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Some verses say I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And at the outset of this chapter, it's important that we realize this morning, church, that God's eternal purpose and goal has always been to restore mankind back to him. That's why he sent a pure and perfect savior into the world to die for sins he had not committed in efforts that all of humanity would obey his gospel and live faithful unto death, given way with him in the kingdom of heaven. But we should all know by now, but it is not according to God's will that none of humanity should perish, but that all should have eternal life. But unfortunately, some have transitioned from this side of life to the condemnation of eternity because of their desire to live outside of the will and the word of God and a disinterest to surrender to him and his holy will and his doctrine and gospel. But when we look at verse 1 of Psalms chapter 23, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I lack nothing. And it's important that we understand when we see the word shepherd, historically the shepherd was the caregiver and protector of a weak and vulnerable sheep or lamb. And when we understand the nature of the lamb or of the sheep, the lamb was a very helpless, 
weak and vulnerable, non-aggressive or ferocious animal. Unlike the lion, the tiger, and the bear, the lamb was a very meek and helpless, non-aggressive animal who needed someone to always guide and protect it. And that was the purpose of the shepherd of the sheep and the lamb was to guide it, to protect it, to care for it, to nourish it. Even so much so that historically and customarily, the sheep would sleep in a circular stone wall. And the shepherd would oftentimes sleep across the entrance of that wall as a sign and indication that he was there to protect the sheep or the lamb in their most vulnerable moments. We've all come to realize that some of our most vulnerable moments are when we sleep. We cannot defend ourselves when we're asleep. We're temporarily unconscious. And for that, and, and, and because of that reason, we can oftentimes be vulnerable to an enemy. So the shepherd would oftentimes lay at the entrance of that circular wall, indicating that I am here to protect my lamb or my sheep and their most vulnerable and their most vulnerable moments. And that's what the spiritual transition of that is. God is saying that he is willing and able to protect us because we are like sheep and lamb in this world. To the devil, we are like sheep, vulnerable sheep and lamb. We're no match for him alone in our flesh. I know our health, our wealth, and our prosperity would have us to believe that we have life all figured out and that we're in control of our lives. But it's important that we realize on this morning, church, that we are no match for the devil alone in our flesh, no matter how strong, how powerful, how influential I may be, I cannot defeat the devil on my own. That's why the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ must be a necessity in all of our lives. Because without the blood of Jesus, we are no match for the devil on our own, and he will consume us now and in eternity to come. Notice what the psalm writer says in Psalms 103. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who has made us. And now we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Ezekiel 34 and verse 31, the Lord says, you are my flock. The flock of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. And then Isaiah, in Isaiah 40 and verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. It's important that we realize on this morning, church, that God is our eternal and supernal source of strength and refuge. We don't live or breathe without him. And that's why it's important that we in this room today in the world grasp the fact that God has to become, as I stated a moment ago, a necessity in our lives. Unfortunately, we live in a world that has made God an option. God has to be the ne a necessity in the life of all humanity. Because without him, without his precious blood, without that sacrifice, we are victims, we're weak, we're vulnerable to the deceit and the destruction of the devil. Just look around, look in your neighborhood, look on your job, look in your schools, look at what everybody else is doing. They're consumed by sin and evil and perversity. If you look on the internet today, if you look on these social media streams, everything that everybody is celebrating and highlighting it's typically that, that that is contrary to the will and the word of God. That lets us know that man has fallen victim to the deceit and the sting of the devil. And man stands in need of a savior. We need the blood of Jesus. Just like our flesh, our bodies need water spiritually. We need the blood of Jesus. He has a necessity to obtain eternal life. And it's important that we preach and share that message with those we come in contact with on this morning. But then notice what the Bible says in verse number two of Psalms chapter 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. Some versions say stream of waters. He refreshes my soul. When we see green meadows, this indicates God's everlasting and providential hand. When David says, he leads me to lie down beside green pastures, what that indicates is David realized 
that God is the source of his nourishment, his strength. William may be able to attest to this. When we plant a crop in the ground, we may fertilize and cultivate the soil and plant the seed, but God has to give the increase for that crop to produce. And he has been doing that since the beginning of time. And when he says green meadows, David is reminded of God's nourishing and providential power and providing power. Just like a green meadow produces lush green grass or a crop produces healthy, strong fruits or vegetables, David is reminded of God's providential hand and power when he leaves him behind besides green pastures. He's saying, look, David, every day I'm here and available and willing to sustain you, to nourish you, just as I do this green field, just as I do the fruits of the vegetables of the earth, I'm willing to sustain you and nourish you. And then when he says, I lead you beside streams of water or a flow of water, that represents God's eternal presence. In other words, David is saying, when I walk beside the stream, I'm led by God in reference to when you consider a stream of water, it has an everlasting flow that typically never ends, and it roars and runs strong in certain parts of the world, in certain parts of the year. And that represents God's everlasting, eternal presence in the life of all humanity. We find something very similar to this in Matthew chapter number 2. At the birth of Jesus, God worked within the astrology of his nature and used his providential hand to consummate the stars of the sky, leading three wise men to the birth of Jesus and where he resided. Philippians 4, 19, Paul says this word, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, speaking of God's providential providing power. Matthew 6, 30 and 31, Jesus says this words, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what should we wear? God is our creator and sustainer of life, and we are his most prized possession. The songwriter said something very similar to this. He says, I have never seen the righteous begging bread or forsaken. If God provides for the birds of the air, or the beast of the fields, the question becomes this morning, church, what won't he do for his most prized possession? Those created in his very holy and divine image. If he supplies and nourishes the lily of the field that are what? Here today and gone tomorrow, then what won't he do for us if we put in our hands in his hand and give him control over the will of our lives? But that's the key. Many today are worn and torn and broken because they have not fully tapped in in a relationship and covenant with God. And the devil has come in and pricked them to forsake God and say that he doesn't exist, all because they have not fully plugged in. What will happen if you halfway plug a light into the wall? You get that flickering, that bulb is on and off, right? It's the same thing with our relationship with God. If we're part-time invested, we're not going to reap the benefits of that full flow and current of electricity that we need to have light. It's the same thing with God. That's why many have forsaken God and they have, have come to the conclusion that he doesn't exist because they have not fully given him control over their lives. They have not fully given him control over the will and the helm of their lives. What did Paul say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. If you give him an honest and fair opportunity, I can guarantee you on this moment, morning, church, and I don't guarantee very many things in life, but I can guarantee you this one thing. If you give God a fair and honest opportunity, you won't regret it. I can guarantee you that this morning. If you give God full control over your life, if you submit to him in his holy will, I can guarantee you on this morning, church, that you won't regret it. Then notice what the Bible says in verse 3 of Psalms chapter number 23. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. God, not vitamins, not diet, not exercise, is our daily source of strength and nourishment. And for, all, for those of us who've obeyed the gospel of Christ, we have been given the presence, the eternal presence of the Holy Spirit, 
which is an extension of God when we understand the deity of Christ, to guide and comfort us on this side of life. It's important that we realize this morning that we honor God with righteous living. And we dishonor God by living lives that are contrary to his holy and divine will. How many times when we speak of dishonoring God have we seen people publicly receive accolades or a reward and they thank everybody but God? Haven't you seen it in the sports world? Or even when people are awarded a position, they'll get up and thank their teachers, their friends, their spouses, and they'll thank everybody except for God. It's important that we realize on this morning, church, that God is our source of strength. Everything that is progressive in our life is because God allowed it to be so. Those things that fall according to his will, of course. And it's important that we honor God, first of all, by our lifestyle, by our actions, by our teachings, by our words. Notice what the Bible says in Psalms chapter 4 and 2. David pens these words in reverence in, in efforts of dishonoring God. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? God, I'm sorry, rather. How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, Paul says these words, For you were brought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Moses, ex Moses in Exodus 15 and 2, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. When we live dishonorable through unrighteous living, we grieve the Holy Spirit that is within those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. We grieve the Holy Spirit through our dishonorable living. Paul said it perfectly, for we were brought with a price. And it's important that we realize on this morning, church, that God is just like we do. When we invest in something, we, don't we expect a return on that investment? Same thing with God. God has invested in us. He has given us his only begotten son. His most prized possession, he gave it freely. And he's expecting a return on that investment he made in us spiritually. That's why it grieves the Holy Spirit so much. That's why it says that God has a righteous jealousy. And he does, because what God is saying in essence is that, listen, I gave you everything. And the awful part is that when some of us live 70 and 80 years without acknowledging the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to trample over the blood of Christ. That's what it means to blaspheme Jesus. That's what it means to live a dishonorable life, to say for God to give such a pure and perfect Savior and for us not to even acknowledge, not to even acknowledge his existence through a lifestyle that is contrary to him and his holy will, totally disgraces and tramples over the sacrifice that God and Christ made on the behalf of our soul salvation. And that's why hell is going to be such a devastating eternal place. Because God gave it all for us, and we owe him through our sacrifice. Just like Christ sacrificed his life for us, he's asking us to sacrifice a life of sin for him and his will and his word and his way so that his kingdom and his church may prevail. And then notice what the Bible says in verse 4 of Psalms chapter number 23. Even though I walk through the dark valley, I will not fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod represents historically God's authority and power and ability to protect and guide his children. Historically, the rod was used to guide and correct the sheep. The staff was a long, slender stick used for stability often exhibiting wear, indicating long-suffering by the owner. And a translation there is that no matter how worn or scarred we may be, like the owner of that staff, God still has a use for us, church. God still has a purpose for all of us. Some of us in this room today have been through some very dark times and dark valleys of life. And thankfully, by the grace of God, he has brought you through. God has a purpose and a use for each and every one of us, no matter how decorated our background may be. 
That's the beautiful thing about God. He's the best friend you ever have. When all have forsaken you, God is willing to be there for you. He's willing to take you in. He's willing to love you and restore you and restore you once again. Notice what David says in Psalms 53, verses 3 through 4. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Paul in Romans 8 and 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God in Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What better ally in our darkest hour of life than God, our eternal father, an eternal force who can never be defeated? Church, there's power, there's prevalence, there's life in being in covenant and relationship with God. That's why I stated earlier, it's not, it can't be a choice this morning. It has to be a necessity because we need God in this path of life, in this journey of life. We can't make it to the other side without him. We need his blood. We need to be covered by his blood to protect us, to guide us, to comfort us. We're going to be going into some very dark days as we get towards the end of this world and near God's return. And the only way we're going to make it through that is that we have a relationship with God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not going to make it if you don't have a relationship with God. That needs to be understood on this morning. You cannot make it without God. God has to be a necessity in each and every one of our lives. And then notice what the Bible says in verse 5 of Psalms chapter number 23. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with all and my cup overflows. And the understanding, the indication here is just as a meal gives us strength and nourishment, God is our supernal strength against our opposition as they witness his protecting power. That's why David used the analogy of God preparing a table before him. What David is saying is that in the midst of, if we remember just a chapter before, David had just come out of an immense pursuit for his life. Saul was immensely pursuing him for his physical life. So what David is here saying is that, listen, God, I realize that you, just like a meal, you're my source of nourishment and strength. And you prepare the table in the meal before my opposition. Why? So that they may witness your saving and protecting power. That's why David says you prepare the table before them. Because you're, my enemies are going to look at me and know that it's not by any right that I have done, that it is according to your grace, your mercy, your protecting and saving power that you have delivered me from the hands of my enemy. And they're going to watch and see how you strengthen and nourish me just like a physical meal strengthens and nourish our body. The anointing represents one being sacred or consecrated and a call to represent God. John says something very similar to this in speaking of the anointings in 1 John 2 and 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it's true, and it's not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Speaking of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God our Father. Psalms 45 and 7. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And then in Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim he not much more, sorry, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. God has invited all of us to join and be anointed and be a part of his body of believers. He calls us now. He calls us now. He wants us to choose him since he's given us the invitation. God wants us to now choose him. 
It's important that we realize on this morning, God is not going to make any of us surrender to his will and his way. For that is the essential meaning of God knowing the heart of man. Many people use that to, to sin, and they say, well, God knows my heart. God knows that I really don't want to sin, but they're living a lifestyle and willfully sinning every day. No, God knows your heart when you choose him after he's extended the invitation to you. That's a sign of a pure and emptied heart for God, that you would choose him and his gospel, that you would choose to surrender to him and give him control over your life, both physically and eternity. That's God knowing and understanding a heart is pure. When you make a valid effort every day to get up, to love, to serve God in spirit and in truth. Worship is not just a Sunday thing. It's a daily thing. We worship and surrender ourselves unto God for our lives sacrificed to him every day that he allow us to live. By the actions that we carry out, by the lives that we present to others, that is worship. That is daily worship. That is daily sacrifice. And that's being pure at heart. That's when God knows that your heart is pure. Does this mean that we're going to be perfect? No, but that means that we make a valid attempt every day to love God, to serve him through his word, through his will, and through his way. And then notice what the Bible says as we come to a close on verse 6 of Psalms, chapter number 23. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I'm covered by the blood of Jesus, goodness and mercy follows me all of my life. What a beautiful covenant. What a beautiful relationship. To know in the days to come that no matter what they do to my flesh, if I'm found in the service of the Lord, if I've obeyed his gospel and surrendered my life to him, I can look forward to eternity one day. That is the eternal meaning of goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. And many of us have experienced it. What a peace, right? What a joy to know that I'm counted amongst the saved, that I'm in that number because I have surrendered my life unto God. What did Paul say? I fought the good fight, right? Now is what? That's a beautiful thing. That was a beautiful moment in Paul's life. All that he had been through, he was able to say with assurance, I fought the fight. I've ran the race. Now there is land for me a henceforth a crown of righteousness. That's what we all need to be looking forward and trying to say when we're on our bed of affliction, when we're getting ready to transition from this life to the next, to life eternal. We ought to be rejoicing and saying, Lord, I fought the fight. I've ran the race. Henceforth has laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That's a beautiful thing. That's the covenant relationship we need to be in with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't want to be found in, amongst the unsaved in our hour of affliction, in our hour of transition. What a devastating thing to be leaving this earth without the blood of Jesus, without ever making a relationship and forming a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I had a good friend of mine, a roommate who was a nurse, and he would tell me oftentimes when he would come home after somebody has transpired, the devastation. They would just be so devastated. And you can just see it on their face. And it's an awful thing to be in that hour, to be transitioning and not know Jesus Christ. What can we say to God in the judgment if he's blessed us to live 70, 80 years and we never got to know him? Would you let a stranger reside with you on this morning? No, you may help a stranger out, but in many cases, we won't let a stranger come into our homes and reside without knowing anything about their character, their personality, their godliness. And it's the same thing with God. Many people today fail to know God, and they'll just say things like, oh, when I get to heaven one day, God is not going to let a stranger who's never created a relationship and covenant with him reside with him eternally. That place is reserved for those who have sacrificed, who have obeyed his gospel, who have lived faithful unto that. And it's important that we teach people these things because people are actually living in this world believing that it doesn't matter how I live. We're all going to heaven one day. That contradicts scripture. That contradicts the Bible. The Bible says that all liars are going to be in hell. Somebody's going and we don't want it to be us. So that's why it's so important that we sacrifice ourselves for the goodness and the mercy of God, that we submit ourselves to his word and his will, that our lights will shine for him and we can look forward to that eternal transition because a day is coming, unfortunately, church, this world is getting worse and worse and worse as time progresses. 
I'm only 36 years old, and I remember as a little kid, I don't remember hearing about people going into schools and shooting them up. I never, before Dylan Roof, heard of somebody going into a church and shooting it up. Look at what the days are bringing ahead of us. People are moving further, further away from the body of Christ and the word of God and to live in their own lust and their own flesh. And that's why it's so vital, as I've been stating and reiterating over and over in this message, that God has to be a necessity because we don't want to live this, leave this earth without him. Paul says he's rose in Romans 8 and 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Psalms 34 and 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And then Psalms 107 and verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Obedience of the gospel is a necessity of you. Thank God has blessed you. For any who may be residing outside of the body, if you think the life is good now, wait till you come in. Wait till you say, as, as, as you see, as the psalm writer says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's when life begins. Unfortunately, the world has us thinking that life begins once you go off to college and get an education and get married and establish a family and have a job and you have a nice home. That's all vanity. That's all vain. Solomon reminded us, reminded us of that. Solomon, as we should know, is one of the richest men that ever graced, ever graced the face of the earth. And he said in his golden age, that was all vanity. All of the things that I pursued was like chasing the wind. It was all vanity. In the world that we live in, we rank and judge people by how they look and what they have. And it is vain and means nothing to God. You've seen it. We rank people because of how they look and what they have. What we should rate and rank people by is their godliness and character. Never forget that, church. These are the things we should define each and every one. If you're looking for a spouse, if you have a friend, you judge everybody by their godliness and their character. Because that's what's going to matter. That's what defines the person. Not by their attractiveness or what they have. Those things are all vain. God is concerned about the heart of man. Your godliness and your character is what matters most in this, on this side of life when dealing with people. And God and people are, most, are God's most prized possession. As we come to a conclusion this morning, church, what have we learned? God wants to be our eternal shepherd. As humanity, we are like weak and vulnerable sheep in need of a shepherd to protect us from the vicious attack of the devil. For we are no match for him alone. Then we learn no matter how scarred or worn we may be, like an old staff, God still wants to use us for his goodness and for his glory. For his well has not yet dried and his door has not yet closed. And then we learn that goodness and mercy accompanies those who love the Lord and have surrendered to his gospel and will and way for their lives. This morning, church, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, he beckons for your soul to do so. But what is the way we can form a relationship with our Father? What is the only way we can form a relationship with God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? This morning, we must first obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? The death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven of Christ Jesus for the redemption and salvation of mankind's soul. How do we obey the gospel of Christ? Faith has led us here to hear more about God's word. Now we must believe that in which we have heard repent and turn away from a lifestyle of sin, confess that which we believe to be true, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and be willing to be baptized in a watery grave of baptism where God will wash our sins away and add us to his body of believers.